times, I've had a great chance to see life changing, the pattern of lifestyle is changing very greatly, but the environment itself changing tremendously. The year that I entered Harvard, the subway was completed and opened from Boston to Cambridge, and up this time been really very much of it, well, MIT could get over to Boston quite rapidly, but MIT <coughs> Must have been been in Boston in those days, <laughs> and uh, I just because when I was young I felt the the great change was taking place that had not been experienced by my father, my grandfather, all the family records I had. I thought it might be a good idea to keep some record of a of a little individual born in the Victorian period and who was coming over in some kind of new world. <laughs> and so I have kept just such records, and I have really very large archives, and they're down in Philadelphia right now. But by virtue of having them, I'm able to look, look at records that are changing things and get sense of rates of change and have some sense of what may be unfolding for humanity on our planet. I think it's very... Born, I was I was seven when the first automobile came into Boston. <laughs> I was eight when the Wright brothers first flew. I was brought up as inherently impossible man to fly. <laughs> Those were very impressionistic years, up to eight years of age. <laughs> and wireless, how crazy can you get? Even though Marconi had invented the wireless the year that I was born, we don't have an SOS till I'm 12 years of age. And so that. These are very extraordinary new things suddenly coming in. Many things that I've been told would never happen were beginning to happen. I was told man would never get to the North Pole, never get to the South Pole. And when I was 14, he did get to the North Pole, and I was 16, got to the South Pole. So there's, there's something that's happening here that the older world had not expected at all. That's all I'm trying to get at. So I felt really, very intuitively, this necessity to keep some kind of record of the transition. I'm sure it's only because it did start during that years ago that you've invited me to be here tonight because I've been able, able to keep some track and have some, been able to make some prognostications that have come true. But I don't think there's any, ever been a moment of uh, humans on our planet where humans have really come to know so much about our planet and about the local universe where humans have ever been in such peril as we really are today. I think we're absolutely on the brink of, of uh, doing away with ourselves. And all of this then relates to, I, I wonder if it'd be possible for me to have a chair brought out. I should have asked for it in advance. <laughs> I have a podiophobia. I don't, don't get behind these things. I can't. <laughs> uh, I think I'll th think better if I'm sitting down. <laughs> Because I operate entirely, I call thinking out loud. Thank you very much. At the, at the age of 32, in 1927, which is the year that Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, which is suddenly a great change again, the human beings not only were now flying, but they were able to cross great oceans. At the age of 32, then, I decided to really make an experiment for the rest of my life, trying to find out what, if anything, a little penniless, unknown individual might be able to do effectively on behalf of all humanity the great nations and great corporations inherently could not do. <laughs> so I was just fairly simply to think about this. Luckily, I'd been in the regular United States Navy, and I'd had some commands, and so I could think about the fact that three co-authors is water, and the 
Navy was concerned with that three quarters of the world is water. Out of the one quarter that is dry land, about half it's covered with ice, rocks, deserts, so that only about one eighth of the surface of Earth was propitious for life support. And that, that one eighth is divided up into, was well, way over 100 nations at the time I decided to do my experiment. So 100 nations dividing up one eighth, each one of them tending to look out for its own. It, 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 there was so much pioneering of humanity, gotten just so far, you continually found yourself being attacked by others. People in America had a little more luck because they were further away from the others. Anyway, quite clearly, those nations were thinking about their fraction of the one eighth of the surface of the earth. <laughs> and the great corporations were operating under the <coughs> protection of the various nations, and they, they had to make profits for a very short period of time where they go out of business. At least that's the way they thought. So they were inherently short-sighted. I saw there was nothing, and nobody was thinking about a total planet as a ship, a spaceship. <laughs> and it incredibly designed, and on board of it, all these humans. And by this time, great, great deal of accumulated knowledge, great identification of resources. So I said, there's nothing to stop me as a little individual thinking about then this total spaceship Earth, I gave you that name after a while, and that, that, that became popular. And nothing to stop me then of seeing how, how to employ the total knowledge and the total resources to take care of all humanity, paying absolutely no attention to any kind of divisions of the human beings, but trying to look at it as all humans. And wondering <coughs> what, it, what and why brought the universe to have humans on board in the universe and, and have them on board this little particular planet. I felt that the more I studied the human beings in contradiction to other organisms, the more I was convinced we had some very important function to fulfill here in the universe. And the universe had no supercargoes, that uh, every, everything was in the universe it was essential to the integrity of the regeneration of the universe. So the function, I, I'll come down to it very rapidly, differentiating between humans and other organisms, I said, all the other living organisms have some built-in integral equipment in the organism itself that gives them special advantage in some special environment, whether kind of a snout on a dog to, to be able to dig in the ground, or some little vine that just could grow up the Amazon do it very beautifully, or birds flying in the sky with beautiful wings, but when not flying, unable to disencumber themselves of the wings because they're integral, therefore walking was a difficult matter for the bird. So I said, humans then don't have these built-in special equipments. A lot of people identify brain with humans, but there are many creatures that have brains, and I found that brain, just if you want to think about it in your own direct experience, Brains are always and only coordinating the information of the senses, without which we don't, are, not, are utterly unaware of the universe. And so they're coordinating the special cases. This one smells a little different from that one. So we have packages of the special case experiences which brains are able to, to store and retrieve memory of. I found humans had a special capability that not manifest by any other creature called which I call mind, because I heard mind and brain in, in, in exchange, but I'm now differentiating clearly brains as physical equipment for the coordinating the senses. And mind, from time to time, had a capability to discover relationships existing between special cases that didn't, were not manifest by any of the special cases considered only by themselves. As for instance, a long, extraordinary case of human beings being excited by the night sky of all those seemingly fixed stars, recognizable constellations, in contradistinction to which they were one, two, three, from time to time, lights that appeared a little bit bigger, brighter than the others, and moved, and they, you couldn't see them moving against things, but tonight they're in a little different position from yesterday. So quite clearly they were moving around, what later on we begin to call the planets. 
And these were so intriguing to humanity that they made all kinds of speculations. They kept records of them as best they could in relation to their periods of seasons and, and other experiences. And they gave them names of gods. But not until human beings had calculating capability, which is really very, very recent, as far as humanity in general goes, which came along with the positioning of numbers and, and the ability then to multiply and divide. If you ever try doing your calculations in Roman numerals, you find how difficult it is. In fact, you can't get anywhere at all. And so not until then these Arabic numerals came in and the cipher itself, and the publication of it in Northern Africa in, 50, in uh, 1200, then took 300 years for it to get into Italy and northern, southern Germany, the point where Copernicus, as a human being, has calculating capability. And with calculating capability and taking the data regarding what we knew of these planets, and suddenly discovers that we're one of those planets going around the sun, the sun is not going around us. I want to really stress how very, very recent is that event, because I find today, though it's 500 years ago, we're really not, and we know, everybody knows about it, we have done very little to get ourselves actually celebrating, reacting in terms of it. For instance, I had a great honor of being invited to speak to the MIT faculty club back in, in the early 50s. And the, I was, the, the dean of architecture at that time was, <coughs> was uh, said to me that he, he found that the architectural department was never being asked to give any faculty club talks because MIT felt that it's so really MIT that the architectural department was sort of a department of liaison with idiots. And that <laughs> so they, they were not really taken very seriously. So he complained to the other deans about it and they said, all right, you, you have the next faculty lecture. And, and he, so the dean asked me to give the talk. And because I, knew about his, his saying about the, fact, the Department of Liaison with Idiots. I, I said to the faculty club when I stood up, I was very surprised to be asked to speak to them because they were all so ignorant. And they looked very surprised and I had to make good in a hurry. <laughs> 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 I said, are there any of you present who do not see the sun going down in the evening? Will you show your hands? There were no hands. I said, you've had 500 years You've known the sun is not going down for 500 years. What are you doing in your education system about coordinating your senses with your information? With, <laughs> I think it's very ignorant to persist in this manner. Keep on saying it's very practical to say sunrise and sunset. Simply rather good poetry, but you keep continually starting your kids off with misinformation. Uh, uh, that, that is enough of that particular <laughs> episode, but I... <laughs> Coming back now to trying to identify humans, and I said we have this phenomenon of mind, and we have this matter then of planets. The idea is suddenly that we, 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 the, we are one of the planets going around the sun. And this enormously intrigued others, and we have Tycho Bray getting better instruments, being a man of great means and making some better observations. He needed a mathematician getting Kepler, and Kepler <coughs> then discovering that all these different planets were different distances from the sun, all different sizes, all going around at different rates. So while they're all the same team seemed to be very disorderly. But being a mathematician, he said, I know one thing in common, which is they're going around the sun, at least that. I could, as a mathematician, give them something else in common. I might be able to find gradient more out have two knowns. So he said, I'm going to give them a known, which is I'm going to give them so, so many days. As I remember, it was 21 days and giving them exactly 21 days, right to the second. He knew where each one was in respect to the sun or the sun. He knew the distance in from the sun. He knew that by this time he discovered the moving elliptical arcs, so he then had the radius from the sun to the start, and then a different radius, a little different radius at the end of the 21 days. He knew exactly then what, he was able to make a diagram of each one of these radius, new radius, and the elliptical arc. And having this, these, pictures now of, of triangles, long, thin triangles. He said, because I, I, I have all the data, I might as well calculate these areas. Well, there doesn't seem to be any sort of 
triangles in the sky, might as well do that. And if you were Kepler and, and did make this calculation and discovered they were not similar, but they were exactly the same, think of it, the astonishment of a human being that hidden in this great superficial disorder was in this elegant mathematical coordination, because they obviously were coordinating to come out exactly the same, all of them. So that he then had to think in a way that you and I have never had, no other human beings have ever had to think before, because he, he doesn't tell you this in his diary, but supposing they were touching each other, he could, might understand how they might move like gears to coordinate, but they were millions of miles apart, millions of miles apart, and human beings had no idea of anything operating millions of miles apart in a way of tension and, and absolutely invisible, some kind of visible tendon operating here. Think of, think of the intellectual challenge that really was. But he, he, he was familiar as a human being and swing a weight around your head. It stays in orbit. If you let, let go of it, it goes off in a, in a line. Also, he was familiar if you want to make an, an ellipse, you have to use two restraints instead of one restraint. So he had to assume somehow or other, because he'd found they're moving elliptically, that there were, there were some kind of restraints or tensions operating over millions of miles. And the fact that they, the planets bunch from time to time made, made them possibly pull on, the bunch could pull on, on the one as well as the sun. <coughs> and so he, had, he, he made, made those kind of extraordinary discoveries. Now, here we have suddenly some interrelationship existing between there's not manifested in any one. <laughs> in other words, nothing in any one planet that said there could be strings to another planet. <laughs> I just want to get out of what I'm talking about, only because there was a group who were behaving this a certain way that humanity never paid any attention. And finally, they were a team that were behaving a little differently from all the rest of the universe. You finally discover there's some relationship going on here. Let's go, we go on from there to Galileo, measuring the rate of falling bodies, acceleration of, of the rate of falling, and getting the mathematics of that. And we have Isaac Newton tremendously eager to understand what this extraordinary invisible tension was that Kepler had, t t had, had now discovered. And we have Isaac Newton then finally being able to work out the fact that the interrelationship, the, the, in, uh, the, in, inter, <coughs> the interattractiveness was varying as the second power of the arithmetical distances apart, but the inverse ratio of it, that's so how the distance between the two, you increase to, one, to fourfold if you Double the distance apart, you went down one quarter of it before. Suddenly we then have a human mind able then to discover the, a mathematical relationship, which first is just hypoth hypothetical, but then is tested and tested and tested by astronomers and always explaining the celestial, the interattractiveness of these celestial bodies, but whatever bodies you're studying. So this gradually became what we call a mathematical generalization, a scientific generalization has found no exceptions whatsoever. And they can only be expressed mathematically. So suddenly we find human mind having a capability from time to time to discover a relationship existing between which can only be expressed mathematically, entirely an intellectual matter. And <coughs> we have then, I said, brain dealing in the special cases. And the special cases were always, always temporal, had beginnings and endings. And, but we have suddenly human mind discovering these principles. And the, I say, if they qualify as a generalized principle, it means they have no exceptions. And that which has no exceptions must be inherently eternal. There's nothing to say that one of these, these generalizations may not someday prove to have an exception, but as far as we know, there is a family of them today which we have no exception. Therefore, we, up to the time we find an exception, they must be considered as inherently eternal. And this is very different. The human brain then asking for beginnings and endings of the universe, and the human mind having capability to discover that which is eternal. I became very intrigued then by the idea of the what we call then behaviors of whole systems, like the planetary systems, solar system, in which the the behavior of the whole is not explained by the behavior of any of the parts considered only separately. We call that synergetic. So that I began to think about the universe in those kind of terms and saying, how many of these generalized principles we discovered? We, as we discover one, we don't know we're going to discover it, but suddenly you have it. Nor do we know whether it's going to be the last one ever to be discovered. We don't know how many there are, but this is the, 
there is an increasing inventory. <coughs> now, there's a principle of, of leverage, the mathematics of that, and as Galileo showed, the, you didn't have to have a, a, a compression lever and compression fulcrum, you could have a tension fulcrum, you could have pulleys and, 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 and the falls carrying out the same mathematics. And so the, there are beautiful mathematical laws which are generalizations that human beings could use objectively as special cases. Now this, this then gave me an idea of feeling that humans were, had a very different kind of function in the universe because they didn't know any other phenomena had access to these extraordinary generalized principles because when you and I use the word design, we immediately would really infer a, an intellectual sorting and deliberate arrangement. Otherwise, the word design seems to be then, it involves a complex of, of that to be sorted and to be arranged. And the best we can see then, these human minds have been discovering these generalized principles. And I said, what is very impressive about them is not only being eternal, now they're all concurrently operative, but they, none of them have ever been found to contradict any of the others, and several, several of them are inter augmentative. So that some totally, I found human mind apparently being admitted to some of the great design of the universe itself. I said, we must be very important to have this kind of, this kind of access. Th therefore, we're now trying to understand why we're about this planet how to think about in the universe itself. I, wa I also want you to think about the very extraordinary change in the phenomena concept of universe just in my day. When I was 28, Hubble discovered another galaxy. <laughs> pretty extraordinary when we called it a galaxy because we had our galactic Milky Way, our galactic system. And suddenly there's another galaxy and today we know of two billion galaxies. This will give you an idea of a rate of expansion of what you and I have to consider as universe. So what you spontaneously in your day think about the universe is vastly greater than anything I had to think about as universe. And that, this, is, this gives you again a sense of the very incredible acceleration of of knowing that is going and taking place with humanity itself. Now, thinking about then this function of humans in the universe, I also said one of the things that's very impressive is that human beings are all born, always born, naked, absolutely helpless for months, beautiful equipment, but absolutely ignorant because no experience. So that, that we are deliberately born that way, even though as our eyes are designed, or just our brains designed with a quadrillion atoms here, coordinates and you and I can communicate. That's all a priori. And so extraordinarily done that we, do, we sort of take it tremendously for granted. And, and, and don't, it's only very recently we begin to, to really take some kind of cognizance of the fact that <coughs> this is such incredible technology that we don't even call it technology because it's way beyond the the kind of grasp that humans so far have, have of technology, the kind of principles we've employed up to date. Now, thinking now, I'm try, from this point on, I'm trying to identify why humans are in the universe and what we might be able to do about carrying on, uh, abetting what nature or universe, why does the universe have us here, and trying to abet the realization of that function. In view of the fact that we were always born naked, helpless, and ignorant, and the relatively short time we know of our being on board here for about, about a three million years, it is amazing to me how human beings being being born had, had naked, helpless, ignorant, but hungry, thirsty, curious, driven to make moves, hungry, trying out this, and, and somebody eats a berry and they die for then a thousand years. That tribe said nobody can eat berries. Then suddenly discovered some berries you can eat, some you couldn't. And nature didn't have any, any manual, operating manual. She could perfectly well have had green safe to eat and red dangerous to eat if she wanted to, but she didn't do it that way. She deliberately for forced us to learn by trial and error. That seemed to be a deliberate part of the design. So that we've had to make an incredible number of mistakes in, in those three million years or, or more. <coughs> and we've gotten now to a point where we have discovered so many 150,000 nuances of experience, which is so unique that they require their own words, and we've agreed on those words. It's an amazing matter we've agreed that much because agreements are very difficult. <laughs> so I find that 
Here we have an enor enormous facility of communication with one another, and we are this, uh, suddenly come to a point where we did get that communication, we then began to accumulate information very, very rapidly, and I felt that all this had to do with the, all of us being born in a sort of group womb of permitted ignorance with an enormous amount of resources with, with, by which, which we could, by trial and error, learn something about why we're here in the universe. And to me then, the most absolutely important thing about it is our minds. Clearly, our muscle is nothing. <laughs> Muscle, uh, uh, we, don't, we can't compete with a donkey. And, and we begin to get to think about, about the energies in our universe uh, that, that I, I, I make sort of rather quick, quick uh, summary of two things. As, the, um, as, as we know, during, during my lifetime, just in this century, we began to discover these chemical elements had unique frequencies when incandescent in an arc flame, which could be detected by the spectroscope. And we have now, using the light from the, coming from the two billion galaxies, we've been able to take that light and run it through the spectroscope, and on board of our planet, little human beings have an inventory of the relative abundance of all the chemical, element, chemical elements present within 11 half billion light years around us. A human mind can, has that kind of scope and capability. But our, our, our muscle, nothing. And yet, muscle and cunning are still in control of human affairs. So this is, very, very, this is why we are, we are in very great peril, because we're here quite clearly for our minds, and minds are not in control. Now, I'll come back to some things that hit me very hard and, and of great significance. For instance, in, in the Navy, where I had then command of, of a, a ship, and I'd been, t been so taught that I could take over the job of my senior, I could take over the ship, or I could take over the fleet if necessary. The whole training was that way, all leading up to a moment of contact and destruction. I wondered how and why all this extraordinary technology, beautiful science, has been produced just to work to, to destruction. And this brought me then to the discovery of <coughs> the fact that for up to 1500, we'd been really thinking about all the universe as a flat universe, even though there were individuals who were quite sure our world was a sphere. But there, that was anything but popular. The general way of thinking about everything was a flat Earth. The Ptolemaic map of going, going back really 3,000 years is, 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 it was, was fitting took in all, all of Europe, North Africa, and Asia, and sort of, a, sort of a rectangular form. Then came to the wilderness and went on to infinity. And, but it was a flat world. Now, this is true of all the great empires of Charlemagne Empire, whether going Roman Empire, anyone, the Genghis Khan, all of those empires, these flat empires going to infinity. And if, if, if you didn't like the way things are, if you, there are an infinite number of gods, an infinite number of chances you come out or if you prayed. So it's worth praying. <laughs> anyway, we have a, suddenly, we have suddenly Magellan and discovering we're on a spherical Earth. And we have the, the most powerful people of these times that learned that the, what we call the control of the w world wealth was by virtue of the controlling of the great waterways. I'm going to, I'd like to ex extend that a little because you are, MIT, and, and we have the, uh, archaeologically the city-state being discovered over and over again, great walled cities. Mycenae in Greece is a good example of it, the beautiful fertile valley, great rung around of mountains. In the middle is a great high hill, and that, on that high hill you could see all the, all the passage coming into the, and you could look at all the great fertile fields that command the whole show. Then you had, by building great walls around the top of that hill, and then walls going down to, a wall, to the well, you had a, a very safe citadel. When you saw an enemy coming, you then took all the foods from the valley and brought them inside the walls that you could. What you couldn't bring in, you could, what they call scorched, you burned them up. So when the enemy came in, all the, the, the local people had all their food inside there, had all their water. The people who came were already hungry, and they could only go 30 days without food, 
and without getting very weak, and then when they get good and weak, and go out and decimate them. And this is, this is why the, the city-state was a very successful invention for thousands of years. But in the meantime, human beings began to build with their three quarters of covered water, going from just dugouts and, and rafts, and they suddenly getting to rib ships. When the rib ships got bigger and bigger, and we get to the point of about the, open, of the time of Mycenae, or even Crete and Crete, island of Crete, there's no fortification because this is the headquarters of the water people, these big, bigger and bigger boats. And we have then the Mycenaeans going in their big boats up to Troy, and Troy commanding the, the traffic from Asia into Europe, most extraordinarily point, complete walled city. So they have all their food inside when the enemy comes, they expect the people outside to starve, but suddenly they, with these great ships, they could go off and get more supplies, continually bring supplies up. This we call the line of supply. And it, then it, Troy fell. And we then, from this point on, history begins then, where the very powerful people control, and the biggest control is controlling great lines of supply. This shows up very much. You get to Italy, where you see all those beautiful, fertile valleys, lovely castellos commanding the valleys. But there's one city in Italy, a very different Venice, and no walls whatsoever, because it's water people. And the water people then took their ships to all around Italy and brought up lines of supply, and they starved all the people out of the Castellos. This is a great change over the fundamentals of humanity. So we have suddenly Magellan going around the world, and the, those who control the great lines of supply between the, uh, the Europe and Asia, who had enormous resources, great wealth had already been developed to bring that wealth to Europe and cash in on it. Enormous ambitions to do that. These ambitions are operate under the names of different countries like France and Portugal, but they're really great, powerful individuals. Queen Elizabeth the I founds her East, East India Company in 1600. Just the after, about three quarters of a century after Magellan gets around, and she then was a private, private enterprise with some of her private friends, and she's able to protect it with her with her, her empire's capability. There's enormous battles. By, eight, by Battle of Trafalgar, 1805, we suddenly, the British Empire is it. And it's said to be the first empire in which the sun never set. In order to carry on and develop that empire, they'd also developed then the East India Company College in England, which is still there, campus still operating, very beautiful campus. And on that campus in 1800, writing just before Trafalgar, five years before and five years after, two different books, have. Thomas Malthus, who is a professor of economics at East India Company College. And he is the first individual in history to have total vital statistics from around a closed system Earth. Because that East India Company College had all these servants all around the world picking up the critical information. So suddenly he had this incredible information. And he was able to write 1800 and then 1810 to confirm it that quite clearly humanity was multiplying itself at a geometrical rate, producing, producing life support only at an arithmetical rate, and quite clearly humanity, majority of humanity, is designed to be a failure. Pray all you want, won't do any good, this isn't it anymore. So this is a very formidable piece of information for those who are in the know, but it was a very general illiteracy, very few people, it was not a popular piece of knowledge at all, but it's the information of those who were in powerful positions making very critical decisions for humanity. We have then, 35 years later, Darwin promulgating his theory of evolution and, and suggesting then survival only the fittest as the fundamental cause of it. Uh, then we have the economists saying, all right, we like that, but Darwin said, I was not, did not, not develop this in economics, it did not mean it, but the economists said, well, it fits our case perfectly. Then we have Karl Marx in England saying, he now accepts Malthus, as, as pure science, is a closed system. It's a closed system, it's hard fat. And we have Darwin, survival on the fit. So Karl Marx said, quite clearly, the worker is fittest to survive because he knows how to handle the tools to make all the products, how to grow the seeds and things. These other people are parasites. Other people said, we're obviously not parasites. We're on top of the heap because the workers are so dull, we need some really bright people around here. Make some, make some important kind of long distance vision, visionary speculations. So we have then, since that time, a closed system Earth instead of a flat Earth, where the, suddenly instead of being dichotomy of different kind of religions, we have, we have the entirely the socialist viewpoint and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the out and out enterprise. Various, various degrees between the two, but 
we have since that time on our planet. The great ideology is saying, you may not like our system personally, but we're convinced we have the fairest, most logical, most ingenious way of coping with lethal inadequacy of life support. But because there are those who disagree diametrically on how to cope, it can only be resolved by trial of arms, which system is fitted to survive. And that's the reason, for instance, that Russia and the United States for the last 30 years have been appropriating over $200 billion a year, some total now over $6 trillion, have been appropriated to buying the highest capability of humanity and focusing on how to destroy most accurately, most effectively, at greater and greater distance, swifter and swifter. This is very, seems to make an incredibly poor investment of all, all, all that we really learned. At any rate, <laughs> that's where it's gone. <laughs> I'm worried about time. I'm trying to think how to get everything I really need to get to in the shortest numbers of minutes. Anyway, what I had begun to experience, I said, here I am in Cambridge, a little boy, and, uh, and uh, suddenly having this wireless come in, suddenly the airplanes coming in, and I said, I really feel something and what, what was really coming in was from a, what we call a visible reality. Everything, reality when I was young was everything you could see, smell, touch, and hear. That's reality. And they said, you, if you're sane and, and, and you're healthy, you knew just what you're doing. <laughs> Suddenly, this is upset very much by Freud and Mesmer discovering a great many things we did we didn't know but just what we were doing. But anyway. It, it, <laughs> When I was young, it was really exactly what I said. You knew just what you're doing. You can smell it, touch it, see it, and hear it, can't you? <laughs> now, I realized something was coming in, which you're called an invisible reality. Because suddenly, there was, year I, when I was three years of age, electrons discovered. Didn't make any newspaper. Nobody knew that's going to be anything. <laughs> and suddenly, there were these alloys. And we're suddenly bringing, by, by, by really accident, all the all the great alloy discoveries by metallurgists have been really accidental up to the time of the space program after World War II. And so we have then alloys. And an alloy is such, for, I just give you in terms of aluminum, which is very dramatically clear. Aluminum is we learned to refine electrolytically only in the, in the 90s, but we don't really use it for anything but souvenir as gas, ashtrays and things like that up to the 1930s when it goes in the airplane for the first time. And the aluminum, in, what, uh, what it uses the obvious property of giving the, the greatest clue to the strength of the material is its ability to go here and not be pulled apart. And so we call it tensile strength per square inch or whatever section we want. And so the tensile strength of the pure aluminum was 18,000 pounds a square inch. We learned then accidentally to, a little copper gun into it and so forth and got up suddenly to double that strength at 36,000. Then during the World War II, the Japanese brought in another alloy we got up to 72,000 pounds a square inch. So I could have three rods of aluminum here, one inch in diameter, say three feet long, all the way the same. No scientist could look at them, tell any difference whatsoever. And this one is double the strength of this, and it's double again. Now, here was something coming into World War I that I, being in a regular line, uh, line officer, became tremendously aware of, and was then, up to this time, everybody knew their spies could see the size ships they're building. It took a long time to build a ship. You could take then the total cubage and the weight of that water, uh, that, that, that cubage of water was all the ship could weigh, everything it had on board. But suddenly, I saw World War I that a ship is coming at you and has the same tonnage as your ship, has the same number of guns, <laughs> same size guns, but yet this you don't know when it's coming at you. This metal is much stronger and fi fire much further away. And this became the most highly classified of secret information in World War I, was the alloys. Are doing these. Suddenly we had an invisible reality. <laughs> And the, the public couldn't tell about it. It's very easy to keep secret because people couldn't see it. Couldn't, and no way to understand. So one ship went to the bottom and, the, and, and they couldn't tell anything about it. And so it's very easy to keep that kind of secret. 
So I, I became fascinated then in World War I to realize that we were beginning to do more with the same and more with less. And I could see it was coming in many different ways in electronics that Malthus didn't know. He assumed if you needed, had a message go across the Atlantic, had to send a ship. It was going to take 40, 50 days. He didn't know how to go and have a little piece of apparatus so I could do it in, in, in 186,000 miles a second. I said, how many things did Malthus leave out? So I began to keep a list of it. By 1917, I really, late 1917, I'd become really very excited to realize there was something going on in humanity here, which had me intuitively curious anyway, where we're doing more with less invisibly, and it might be some day where you do so much with so little, it might be possible that Malthus is wrong. It might be enough for everybody if we did enough for this. This is a terribly challenging idea as a kid to really get it to see it could be true. I came out of the Navy when the building world, and stayed in that building world for five years, and, and I found it thousands of years behind the arts of the environment controlling the sea and the sky. I just, for instance, point out to, while you talk about how much you know exactly what a Boeing 747 weighs, loaded three tons, and her rate of climb, how many people she can, you know everything she can do out of every pound of material you put in, every ounce of that our materials are every erg of energy, every second of time. But you ask people what buildings weigh, they don't know what the buildings weigh. If you don't know what buildings weigh, you certainly don't have any way to ratio performance. So just want to get an idea of the building world on the land being thousands of years behind that of the sea and the sky, where you know exactly what you're, what you're getting out of every ounce. You have to know. And so I, I became excited to realize that it was in the building world that we we're really behind because there's something called priorities and in, in, in relation to the military. If the heads of state then are going to have to protect themselves against other states, they're going to defend themselves, there's not enough to go around, they've been told that, then they leave things to the military to, to defend them. The military say, well, all right, we now know that there are these chemical elements and there's so much mercury, and there's so much helium, and they do something absolutely unique that nothing else will do. Who has access to these absolutely unique, high-performance materials? Who has access to the unique, very high-performance special instruments and tools, production tools, very, very well-trained brains? Obviously, then, you have something, you had priority of access to the high-performance capabilities. The military had that. This meant, then, if you have priority, you have to have anti-priority. Who has to make do with a low performance or no performance at all? It was obviously the home front, not enough of people anyway, let the poor devils get on the best they can. So I saw that the human beings being beautiful human beings and trying to make the best of life did get up an architecture that was, to them, least attractive out of, out of the make-do. <laughs> but we had them big and heavy, the th thicker the walls, the more secure. That idea went out, uh, even uh, in architecture, along with the the uh, Maginot Line. Uh, <laughs> and right up to then, you, you consoled yourself that way. The bigger and heavier and higher the walls, the more secure. We used to have all the advertising when I was young about great insurance company was strongest, or safest of rocket Gibraltar. <laughs> Which they don't use that advertising anymore. <laughs> uh. <laughs> now, what I excited me in 1927, I'd been, been in this building world and found that no scientist ever even been asked to look at the plumbing. Just think of it. No scientist ever done anything about the plumbing. You, you, have, you have beautiful courses here on, on frictions and pipes and things like that, but nobody's redesigning the plumbing. <laughs> here, we, here we have the human beings, every one of you, several times a day, taking this beautiful sun evaporation, water getting in the sky and coming down absolutely pure to us, and we take that beautiful water and we use four and five gallons several times a day to get rid of a pint of yellow. <laughs> how, how much sense does that make? <laughs> and I'll just say, there's no, no uh, the, the home front was absolutely thousands of years behind the out of the sea and the sky. So I, in 1927, the American Institute of Architects, as they do today, had a, their journal, and their journal, they published buildings they thought well of, and they had a single family dwelling in Illinois in 1927, which they thought was optimum for under the conditions of 1927. I took that total floor area, total cubage, 
total number of windows and lumens of light that could get in, everything it had equipment to do, listed all the performance capabilities, and I took its total weight, including the pipes out to the mains, it came out 150 tons. Then taking the, having to match the same cubage, same number of floor, floor area, every performance capability of the single family dwelling Illinois, but using the most advanced aircraft design of the time, it came out only three tons. So I said three tons against 150, if we really began to, instead of waiting, which was going on in those days, I saw after the military developed something, then suddenly it became obsolete, that particular weapon, and people were all tooled up to produce this kind of equipment, then look around the home front for some outlet. This is how, for instance, the refrigeration which we'd had in the Navy for 25 years suddenly came up in the land in the 20s, and suddenly it didn't have to have ice in your box there. And so I saw there's a fallout that came very secondarily, very laggardly, maybe a quarter of a century, maybe half a century later, came into the home front and began to change the standard of living. In, in the terms of which, just in my day, we've gone from less than 1% of humanity to 56% of humanity, enjoying a higher standard of living today than was known or experienced by any potentate when I was born. And during that time, we doubled the population, so actually 112-folded the number being benefited by the advanced technology, but all is a very slow feedback from the preoccupation with how to kill. So I said, supposing we didn't wait for that, but looked at the home front right away, and I, it might be, I was indicated by this three tons against 150, that maybe we could really get doing so much with so little, we could really demonstrate to humanity that it really is enough to go around. So that was 52 years ago, and I have been engaged in that direction ever since, and then now I, that brought me across into geodesic structures and where I could do very much more or very much less. And there are now over 200,000 of them somewhere around the world. They're in very remote places where the very highest kind of performance is required, where other kinds of structures would just would not do, whether they're ringing the dew line as radomes or a great experimental station over the South, South Pole, or whether radar on top of Mount Fuji able to withstand the most extraordinary hurricanes and gales, snow loads, so delicate the microwaves can go through, yet so light that one helicopter took it up then just fastened in place like a great bird landing. So I've had enough experience in the logistics of environment controlling, and I've, due to the fact that also I've been carrying on since 1927 what I call the world, world game. Instead of, of the Navy game, of World War games, where the people in the land were not concerned, but the Navy is concerned with the three quarters of the water. And they then, how is going to, who's going to get control of the line of supply? That's the whole story. And what, how many resources are there around the world? The whole training of the Navy was to learn those things. And how, I said, I'm going to play a game called World Game, not World War Game, where I look at the sum total and see how I can use it, if possible, to make all humanity a success. It seem to be in, indicated as, as, as implicit in this trending of doing more with less. Now, I, I, so I've kept all kinds of curves. I kept the curves of the rate of increase of the tensile strength in the steels, and, and, the, and then got into uh, the luminum, found that I could predict that the luminum curve would follow it, and it did, et cetera, et cetera. And by keeping enough track of all the total data, I've been able then to be able to say certain things. But I, Ten years ago, I was able then by actually design, able to say it is now incontrovertibly evidenceable in engineering that we within 10 years of a design revolution where using only proven technology, using only metals already mined that are recirculating, it was feasible within 10 years to have all humanity at a high, living at a higher standard of living than any humans have ever known before on a sustainable basis, because during those same 10 years, we can phase out forever all further use of fossil fuels and atomic energy. We can live entirely on our energy income. Now, this became, I say, incontrovertibly dem demonstrable. For instance, I've just taken the en energy side. And we have a book which is called, uh, published by our world game, Energy, Earth, and Everyone. You'll be able to get copies of it from, from uh, Doubleday in July. The first printings went, were exhausted, and the, the title went from 
the straight arrow press in San Francisco to Simon Sister, who sold it in Double Day, and Double Day been very slow on bringing it out, but it'll, it'll be out in July. You find absolutely incontrovertible our ability to live on our energy income. And incidentally, I'd just like to mention the following to you as, as a world of technology. Then at World War II, the grand strategy against Hitler was then to cut off his energy. And they were able to then bomb Ploesti and so forth. Immediately, <coughs> the German scientists went to work and they learned how to keep their economy going on their energy income, from the, totally from the vegetation. They were able then to go into four, the four kinds of alcohols, the Grand Central Station of Energy, and from there they could get, you may remember, they also developed the very high performance rubber, and where instead of having the 10,000 mile tires, got up to 50,000, or they did this all out of alcohol. Uh, coming entirely from vegetation, they were able then to pr produce high octane gas, gasoline, were able to produce food, and they kept the economy going. It's very amazing to me that the, Russia, the United States rushing in as they did in Berlin, and I, because I was in the Board of Economic Welfare, and I know we had all that data. None of this data had been brought out in the energy emergency here. I want you to realize, that, that, that's, why does that come out? Well, the next thing I discovered, having made a statement such as I've just made to you, been able to make it 10 years ago, and, make, and been making it publicly ever since. You, you get checked up on such statements, and I, I possibly over a thousand really quite competent people have checked over my data and find it's correct. There may be about a million people who will credit those thousand, and so I, there's, there's, but there are four billion human beings, so the humanity doesn't know this, but there is an increasing number who know that it's possible. Now, the next thing I discovered was that all big government, which is, uh, is political, all big politics, all big religion, all big business, found it absolutely devastating the activity to have humanity as success. They're all predicated on humanity being trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Come to me, join our side, we'll get a little better deal. <laughs> no. your, your poor people, come here, I'll comfort you and get you in heaven, you know? <laughs> all the different things. Everything predicated on man being in great pain and trouble. So then I realized that while there may be individuals who might be very excited by anything, you, you as a little individual might do in way of finding a little better way of sun, sun energy and pounding, because it all does come from, all comes from the sun, that uh, they, they, they pay lip service to you, but big governments going to do nothing about it. <laughs> so I began to say, what are our odds here? Here we, here we come to new, new knowledge, first time in history, we don't have to be a failure. If you don't have to be a failure, well, it doesn't, doesn't have to be you and me ever again. It doesn't have to be any war. You don't have to rationalize selfishness. You don't have to rationalize why your family is a little more deserving than the other fellow's family. That's why you should cheat the other guy. Just think that we get in that kind of relationship to the to, to universe. Anyway, I said, that does not seem to me to be unreasonable, but I saw that hydrogen atom doesn't have to earn a living before behaving like a hydrogen atom. In fact, the only, only function that's come into the universe, we know how, how to do this you or me, as <laughs> far as I know, is the human beings. And all the rest of the universe is working very extraordinarily, eternally regenerative. The only 100% efficient system we know of. Now, so this then brought me to observing everything else I could in evolution is going on. I'll give you some, a very big evolutionary event. Historically, humans like other mammals. The female carrying the young can't cover as much geography annually as can the male. The North American wolf averages a very much greater sweep out the male does than the female. And so we have the this is humans. And the human woman, female man learned to get that fire going, and she could then keep the, the food last, lasting as long as she learned how to to dry it, to keep, do this very thing. She stayed around the hearth, preserving, consolidating the gains. The man was the hunter, and he'd bring in a new kind of creature. She would decide whether to skin it or milk it. And, <laughs> and, <coughs> and so gradually, the man not only was a hunter, but he also was a news bringer, because he got to the top of the mountain, and the other people hadn't been there. So to the, all the children through history, mom and dad, with the authority and what you could eat, <laughs> what, that, what that dad and mom had found that you could eat, what the chieftain would put up with and so forth. Dad and mom were the authority <laughs> for this new little life here. 
Not only that, but Dad, in addition, was the was a newsman. Mm -hmm. And Dad's language was very inadequate and very poor over the great ages. But anyway, this is what he'd, he'd seen from the top of the mountain, or he'd heard that the chieftain said, and his language was very poor. But he, the kids then, Dad is the authority, and this way Dad says it. So. The, the esoteric way of communication went to the kids all right, but it started more and more dialects and different languages. Suddenly, we have, when I, I said the electron coming in when I'm three, year I was, I was 23, we have the human voice on the radio. Year I was 27, we have the first licensed broadcasting radio station. 1927, all the daddies were coming home one evening, and all the Kids said, Daddy, come in, listen to the radio. A man's flying across the Atlantic. And Daddy never brought the news home ever again. <laughs> Stop. Uh, nobody thought about this anthropological. <laughs> and somebody saw the news was it, and you're, you're preoccupied with the news. But the fact was then, the people who got their job on the radio got it by virtue of the commonality of their diction rather than special esoteric way that Daddy said it. And they did it by virtue of the size of vocabulary and the versatility in employing it. That's why they got their jobs and maintained them. And this liquidity in which they could get it out. So the kids then saw dad and mom listening to that radio. And they saw dad run across the street telling what the radio man said. <laughs> so quite clearly, these were more, dad and mom in authority, but these are more of authority because dad and mom are learning from them. <laughs> so the kids then emulated the words the way the great authority said it. This completely changed the speech pattern of humanity. One of the things I've lived through is that change. I'll show you here in Boston, my first jobs before World War I, I worked with some very expert craftsmen, very fine human beings, they're very lovable. But their vocabulary is about 100 words, 50% blasphemous or obscene. <laughs> uh, mainly the way they, they spit and let you know how they felt about it. Uh, this has really changed, it's incredible to me. I, I now have been around the world, world 44 times, and the vocabulary around the world is just extraordinary. I can really use the very best I, I have in me, and I find myself being understood very readily. Now, this all changed in our lifetime, and it came about by virtue of that radio, and getting some commonality of diction, that's the point. Now, the <coughs> next thing that happens is the Nobody said to the kids this great authority. It was simply uh, uh, self-evident that this is the great authority. Now, and the kid instinctively followed the great authority. <laughs> the child wants to know. So then, what you, as you know, the speed of sound, approximately 700 miles an hour. Speed of light, approximately 700 million miles an hour. Approximately a million times faster. And the sound only operates in our atmosphere, and the, and the light goes right on. The amount of information you get visually in re relation to what you get through your ears is, is a million fold. So suddenly we had the young students at Berkeley Cal University of California making the world news as dissenters about the educational system. I, that particular group asked me to come and meet with them, and I met their contemporaries many universities that year. They, they, they graduated, and the, and the majority of them graduated in 66. This is then that <coughs> suddenly I found those kids were born the year the television came in the American home. And they all said, I know that dad and mom love me to pieces. I love dad and mom to pieces. But they don't know what's going on. I have a slight idea what's going on. They don't have anything to do with our going to Korea or going to the moon. They don't have anything to do with anything. They're just lovable human beings. But the world is in trouble. And this information we're getting from around the world, not just locally anymore. Well, I, I guess I had very local information when I was young. They're really getting world news, world's in trouble. The older people don't know what's going on. I've got to do my own thinking. Now, I'll show you one of the things that was very different about this. When I was young, my father died and I was very young. My mother said, I'm going to send you the best school I can afford to do. I don't have very much money, but I'm going to want you to. And she said, darling, never mind what you think. Listen, we're trying to teach you. I went to school and said, never mind what you think. Listen, we're trying to teach you. I was continually told me, no, never mind what you think. I was also being told by men, as I got older, that life was very tough, it had to be you and me, so you've got to get over all your sensitivity. Get over your sensitivity, never mind what you think. So I, I, was, I found myself out of gear with it also. It was sort of a game that you had to learn. And so I, I, I learned the game as best I could. But nobody's saying to the young world anymore, never mind what you think. There's just none of it. 
And you suddenly have a young world, 19, let's, just going back then to the 60s, where suddenly a young world started doing its own thinking. It's very new at it, very idealistic, with Russia and the United States spending 200 billion a year on how to destroy about, they, they appropriate about 20 billion a year, or 10% of it, on how to break down the other man's economy before you get to the war. And that's, a, so the United States had free press and very easy, to, very much easier to operate against than, than was the Russian side where they didn't have free press. I heard the Russians say, they said to me many times, you can't understand why you keep a free press because we can send a, get a bonfire going in America, it goes all over the place. At any rate, we have then, there was no question about the young people who were very idealistic being exploited by, very ingeniously, and so there, all, there was all kind of activism then in the 60s. But then suddenly the kids found they were using their heads for battering rams. They said, I'm supposed to use my head for thinking, not for battering ram. So they began to develop an immunization to the being exploitable. So today they're nowhere nearly, I find, each year I find a very great difference. I have been a visitor now in 550 university colleges around the world, many of the colleges many times like MIT, and almost innumerable times. So I really have quite a good feeling for you to tell you that there is a very great strength in that young world today doing its own thinking and realizing it is an invisible world and, and you only have to have competence to really carry on in the invisible world, the invisible reality. So this is what you have here at MIT, all places. So the next thing I saw was the, each child being born successively was being born in the presence of less misinformation. And each little child being born successively being born in the presence of much more reliable information. Now, I saw that I'm, I'm getting letters today, not frequently, but I get them, say, four or five a year from eight and ten year olds who have been born after man got to the moon. And how they find that I'm somebody they can write to, I don't know, but they do. The letters are beautifully written, and they say, humanity can do anything it needs to do, why don't we make this thing work? They're completely they're full, of, full of concern about it. So I say, nature is coming through with something new here in way of uh, capability. And, uh, and, uh, so I give you also, I'm being born naked, helpless, ignorant, having learned by trial and error. Humanity then getting to the point where it did develop words, did gain a whole lot of information, but made an incredible number of misinterpretations about If you take a polished steel ball 16 inches in diameter, it, it would probably be rougher than our Earth's planet. Pictures taken of our planet coming in from outer space, we can see through the cloud cover. You can see the blue water, the brown land, but you can't see mountains let alone human beings. Human beings are, you and I are standing on top of one another's head making a chain, take 10,000 of us to make the difference between the outermost and innermost points of our Earth. So you and I are one 10,000 is visible. Now, our planet Earth is, is diameter is about one one hundredth that of the sun. If you look at the suns in the afternoon when this cloud in front of it is a white disk, take coins out of your pocket at arm's length to try to cover it, you find a nickel just about covers it. You'll find that the, the size of it of our Earth against our, our school rulers, remember, 16th of an inch, but engineering scale to get down to 50th, a hundredth of an inch. But beyond there, everything gets blurred. To have the very finest printing where seeming absolute continuity of red and the colors, you have two hundredths of an inch. At any rate, our, our planet Earth is so small against the sun, as you and I can see it, you couldn't see it. <laughs> so you and I are invisible on our planet, and our planet's invisible against the sun, which is a rather inferior star, we have a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. And let's look at Orion's belt, and there are two, two bright stars there. One of them, Betelgeuse, is large, its diameter is greater than the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So there's a good sized star, all right, but understand we have a very small star. We have one hundred billion stars in our galaxy. We now know of two billion such galaxies. <coughs> Obviously, that kind of universe is not interesting whether Republicans or Democrats are being elected. <laughs> Nor is it interested in our baseball news or anything else. <laughs> we on our planet here are talking practically insanity in relation to our universe. So I saw that nature then did this cutoff where she had all of us in this group womb and with all the resources by trial and error to get enough information to get to the point where we make some completely new judgments. 
the kind of information I've luckily happened to be just a functioning and I did come to it, we now know there's enough to go around. It's clearly demonstrable. At which point we really have to have a completely new generation. So I see when nature has a child in the womb, the child has to have oxygen. But the mother's out where the oxygen is, and so she does the breathing, gets it in the bloodstream, have an umbilical cord to get to the child. When the child comes out, you cut the umbilical cord, because it now gets its own. I think nature then had what I call a metaphysical cord. She had it where the, uh, the older people were telling the younger ones what they've been able to find out, to accumulate things, to get some words, to get, get a working start. But we got to the point where such, so many misinterpretations of the significance have been made that there's a time that came for a cutoff. So she suddenly has this young world cut off. That's, a, that's all I want to get at. To me, it's an enormous, enormous evolutionary event, an incredibly big evolutionary event that a young world is suddenly doing the thinking. As I said, I brought up here, never. All the older world is assuming the capa thinking capability, you know, are absolutely un unreliable. So here we are in this new chapter. And I can see that maybe that young, the new youngs coming through will really take over. And things are becoming less and less tenable. Now, we found quite a long time ago the great religions realized they could not stay operating just within 150 pens of nations. So they became transnational. Then we found all big business found that. They were all going transnational, taking all the money out of America, incidentally. And so we have that. Uh, the Americans have 150 people, you know, have 4 billion people in 150 pens subject to drafting, and uh, anybody, can, any big powers can use it, just throw you up against their enemy, whether you like it or not. We, we are in a condition now where, first, fortunately, we've discovered the scrap recirculation. We don't have to do any mining. And that scrap recirculation, we have 150 pans, we really have 150 blood clots for the economics to really work of the recirculating regenerative universe, which we're finding ourselves in, instead of the Yesterday, looking out just this way, we now discover ecology over here, that the whole system is regenerative. So we're part of an enormous regenerative system, the universe itself, where things are going off like that rather than in front of us. I then just feel that the, the, um, there's a great, great possibility that this younger world will very quickly reject something. I'm going to run some slides for you now because I want to get a little sense of acceleration and some other big evolutionary events. May I have slide number one? <coughs> this slide number one, does anybody know what that picture is? <laughs> I took it from a high school wall in, in New York City. Well, on, on it, Greenland is bigger than South America. <laughs> North America, we're very big. We're, we're bigger than Africa. The United States is enormous, much bigger than Europe and everything else. So, so it's very flattering. But this, this part of Russia over here seems to be 25,000 miles in that part of Russia and only a mile apart. So it's, it's, there's no Antarctica. It, it, that, that we could show this to kids at school, that companies keep selling such junk as this, that seems to be incredible to me. If I, I said years ago, if I want to really think about total inventory of our resources, I need a background against which uh, there's no visible distortion. I'd like to be able to take the data of a sphere and project it out in the flat. And I did discover a way of doing it. I'd like to tell you rather quickly how, you, how we did it, because uh, completely unlike any of the methods of projection that have been used. As we find mathematically, you can divide, you can get three triangles around a corner as in a spherical tetrahedron. You can get four equilateral triangles around an octahedron's corner. You can get five icosahedron around a corner. You can't get six because six, you, have, you have 60, 60, and you have 360 degrees, be a plane going to infinity. So in order to come back in itself, the limit number of equilateral triangles around a corner can only be five. If I took this spherical icosahedron with its 20 equilateral triangles, each of the corners is 72 degrees, I made a, found a method then of, of take a steel, if you think about a steel band, three steel bands which have inch, inch marks on them. If I bend one of them, the inch marks remain still an inch apart. If I then have 
take three such bands and, and I, I'm going to put, or I'm going to take each one of those bands and weld some, each one will be 12 inches long, the band, and I've got a 12 inch long rod going through each one inch point, perpendicularly through it, welding it into place, very stiff carbon rod. And so it's six inches below, six inches above. <coughs> if I take those ends of those rods and pull them together with one steel band, the whole band will just bend, but the one inch points on the band don't change, the whole uniform scale, whether they're flat or, or in, the, in the bend condition. If I take three such, three such uh, steel rulers with three sets of, uh, sets of rods going through them, I spoke about it, and have a little, a, a, a put a little bolt at the, at the ends, bolting three to make it a triangle, it looks like a sort of triangular fence. Now I'm going to take hold of the bottom of all those rods and pull them together. It makes each of the, uh, the bands bend, but it makes two of the bands bend away from the third band. It opens up the, the angle of the corner. It makes what it called a spherical triangle. So we can get it up to 72 degrees, and that's be then spherical. So with the icosahedron, I have 20 spherical triangles, each whose corners are 72 degrees. When I take them off, holding my uniform boundary scale, so we don't let any infinity in the system at all, then the corner angles go from 72 to 60, which is called 12 degrees spherical excess. But because it's done absolutely symmetrically in equal angled triangles, then the, there's a shrinkage of the data inside the triangle, but not along the edge. The edge holds absolutely true. There's a very mild shrinkage internally, in the, most, the little most of the center. And the shrinkage is so minor, there's no visual distortion between the relative shape and size of any of the parts on the sphere or out on the flat. Now, I'm going to show you a map which will not look familiar to you at all. Next picture, please. This is made out of my, my triangles, which are such that, I wonder if I can, somebody help me a little more chord. I think that as there is a light pointer, is there not? Is there more chords here? Good. I think I can get up here quite well. There are on, on this map, incidentally, 100 white dots. Each one is 1% of humanity, located very accurately for the center of that many people. On this, for instance, let's, let's look at, here is then Greenland, there's Greenland, and there's, you can see then, it's one third the size of Australia. And uh, th now we have the Antarctic showing. Now, uh, I gave you then the dots of the human beings, 1% each. And here's the equator going through South America, only three dots south of it. Here's where the equator goes through Africa, you have only two dots south of it. You have going where it goes through Java and Sumatra, some totally 10 white dots are south of the equator, but ve very close to the equator. 90% of humanity lives north of the equator, and the small 10%, just a little below it. Thank you, sir, very much. Now, here, here there's where the equator goes through Africa. Here's where the equator is going through here, and through Java and Sumatra through here. So mainly, then, we have a, where the people living in the southern hemisphere, and humanity knows very, very little of this great southern hemisphere, where we just came to the Antarctic in, in, when I was 16 years of age. We have then, I spoke to you about the British. And this, is a, this is a water ocean world, and this is the way things were when I was young, and it took remotest people from one another, took them six months to reach each other. My father was in the, here we are in Boston, in the leather importing for the great shoe business here. He imported from Buenos Aires and Calcutta. It took him exactly two months to go to South America each way, two months each way, and it took him exactly three months to get to Calcutta, and three months each way. So humanity was really divided. This is what Kipling called the East, and this is what he called the West, and he said, East is East and West and West, never the train shall meet, because he was not in an airplane world, he was thinking in a water world. And here we have then that 54% of humanity, 29%, and have in the Americas only 12% altogether. Now, in that water world, you could not ship, ch change your cargoes at sea. The two ships would chew each other up. So harbors were of the greatest importance as, for that great international trade. And so just coming to America, we have Boston, we had St. Lawrence, which frees up in the winter. 
Boston Harbor, many times it got pretty badly iced up. There's nothing to compare with New York Harbor for deep water and an enormous amount of deep water front, well protected inside of, of the Long Island and Staten Island. Then we have then on the West Coast, we had San Francisco, Seattle. There are relatively few, few harbor, good harbors in the world. In, in North America, then, we began to build a railroad between the east and west of the San Francisco and the, and the New York and so forth. Now, in 1961, three jet airplanes, which nobody knew were going to be coming, three jet transport airplanes outperformed the Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, and the steamship United States. In the year 1961, ships of the sea became obsolete. Again, big, big evolutionary event but for, for how humanity gets from here to there. From here on, they're getting there by air, which is utterly undreamed of in my, my mother's time. So we have then, here's that great water ocean world. And the British who were running it then found, got down the southern uh, the Pacific here, you get on the roaring forest. The, while the world went, goes around west to east, the water went faster than the crystalline earth, and the winds even faster still. So we have what we call the roaring forties going around here. You can't, there's no such thing in the, in the Arctic. But in the Antarctic, there it is. And you see where the great ice flows chewed through in what we call the Great Horn. So the British discovered all you had to do is come south in the Pacific, got in the Roaring Forties, going right in the Atlantic. Came south in the Atlantic, right on the Roaring Forties, in the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean, right in the Pacific again. They then, what did the British guard? <laughs> they guarded southern tip of South America, Af South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. They guarded the America around. The people were all the way out here, no idea what. So this, this is a picture you're seeing first time, the British Empire, which they were not eager for anybody to see. Anyway, there it is. And now, 1961, those airplanes did what I said. Next picture, please, Num number two. So suddenly we have here what are called the sky ocean world. It's the first time in your life, or any, if, you have, if you haven't seen this map before, it's the first time humanity is able to see all of the surface of our Earth without an invisible distortion of the relative shape or size of any of the parts and without any break in the continental contours. We have one world island and one world ocean. It took me two years to find out how to get all those sinuses into the water. But anyway, there it is. So suddenly this is the new intimacy this way. This way we're going to be going. And we're still here. I'm just reading today, this day's paper about New York getting in a new convention center for 350 million. Do anything, there's so much property in New York and San Francisco that they do anything to get convinced somehow to keep it going, but absolutely dead, obsolete, utterly obsolete. We have then, when I was young, 90% of Americans were on farms, today only 7%. And all the people sort of for a moment of hanging fire are in, using those cities, sort of dormitories. They're sort of big university areas, but they're obsolete as anything, uh, anything to do with any, the way they were conceived originally. And now, on this map, you'll find humanity. I now find it. It is 95% of humanity can reach each other on the shortest great circle air routes without going near the Atlantic, Pacific, or Indian Ocean. So this, this is a north-south world. And I found something else very fascinating. It's coming in with the, you may remember, that the, de the delivery of electricity, uh, delivery of energy from here to there. There's no way we can get so much so fast as by wire. And our limit of the practical deliverability from the World War I on up to recently was only 350 miles when go across the time zones. But since, since the space program came in, got in what are called ultra high, ultra high voltage, we can now deliver 1,500 miles. I made a world network of electrical energy networks, not only then showing how we then go across our time zones and, and integrate those time zones. We can reach very nicely from here to Alaska. And in, 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 in Alaska, we can reach right across. The Russians have been then building hydraulic electric stations of all the northerly flowing rivers in here. 1,500 miles, you can reach across to the Russian network. Well, that means you can get into the China network and all the rest of the world. Now, when Trudeau was about to make his first trip to Russia, I, uh, he, we are friends, and, and I showed him my electrical energy network grid, and he was very excited by it, so he took it and gave it to Brezhnev. Brezhnev had his, his technical people check in. They said it looked very, very, very practical to them. I can simply say to you, with all the nonsense going on in our world, 
money world today, we've completely separated money from wealth. Wealth being the ability to take care of human life. We have, as I just gave you a little while ago, we, the ability to take care of everybody the highest standard living others. We have four billion billionaires on the planet right now, but the way the game of money is being played, keep everything very scarce again. So that the, the money game is going to go out completely, it's going to be a mess. But what will happen is we'll all get on to the, what, what is the accounting system of the universe? It's energy, energy and time. Energy and time, <laughs> That's, and nothing else. And so we're going to get on energy time. So the minute we get on the same grid, <laughs> It's going to be very, very easy to really have the, 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 uh, the uh, fractionating, whatever we need to do, the way of accounting can be done this way absolutely beautifully. So I'm, I'm going to give you a few little quick insights. Now that, that, that is all I'm going to show you in the way of pictures. All I want to do is to may have the lights on. I mainly just wanted to give you a sense of very swift, oh no, one, oh, 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 sorry. One more, one more, one more, one more. Right. Sharpen it up best you can. Now, people, you won't be able to read this chart, so I just simply tell you what it's all about. It is a chart that is 800 years long. And am I in your way too much here? This chart, I wanted to have, if I could, a way of charting gains of science against time. Within science, of course, we have then, when you say pure science, that within pure science you have the isolating of the chemical elements. And the isolating of the chemical elements happens to be a closed system affair, where membership is absolute and by, by the number, and has to, all the numbers have to be filled. We have one electron, one proton, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody can cheat in there. Anyway, we have, when history opens, man, humanity had already uh, discovered and was using the we have carbon, lead, tin, mercury, silver, copper, sulfur, gold, and iron. On this chart, I go up one step every time we isolate a chemical element. So it starts nine steps high. It's 1800, 1200 AD is the first known isolation of a chemical element by a human being, arsenic. So that's where my chart starts. We go 200 years, then we come to antimony, 200 years more, and then phosphorus, then 75 years, and suddenly starts climbing very rapidly. You see an accelerating time and a slowdown time, accelerating, slowdown. The accelerations are always peacetime, the slowdowns are always wartime. Now, we get to a point where, now I'll get the pointer again, and suddenly this very much was flattening out here. This is the this is 1932, the depth of the Depression, but also the year in which we made the 91st isolation of chemical element, only 90, out of 92, 91, only present on our planet so we could isolate. Anyway, we have here then the shelves are full for the first time in history. We've taken the physical universe apart in its own unique chemical elements to be reassociated in preferable ways. From there on, we get into post uranium, and then suddenly, going like this. Now, it's very interesting. They come in here, they don't come in by the number. Chemical number 37 might be the 17th isolation and so forth. But from here on, they're coming in exactly by the numbers. It's a very extraordinary thing. Anyway, against this background of pure science, we have then applied science, obviously. And what, what does humanity try to do with its top capability? It tries to close he starts naked, and he has to then get some, some skins on it so he gets ready to get in the cold. <laughs> then he put a double skin in a, a tent and gets ready to look colder still. I find then, against this big background of science, I said, I give humanity then the requirements to develop an environment control device, which he can get into, and from inside of it, control the energies operating outside to take him in one complete circuit of our planet. We're going to have an absolute standard performance requirement against this background. So here he goes around in a wooden sailing ship for the first time. 350 years later, goes around in a steel steamship. 75 years later, goes around in an aluminum airplane. 35 years later, goes around in an exotic, exotic metals rocket. At the time of this wooden sailing ship, nobody could dream of the possibility of a steel steamship. 
At the time of the steel steamship, nobody could dream of an aluminum airplane, let alone we hadn't learned to fly yet. At the time of the aluminum airplane, nobody could dream of exotic metals rocket. So you're having something enormous acceleration going on here. You have this basic acceleration of science against time. We have a contraction of 350 years, 75 years, 35 years. This one took two years to go around. This one took two months to go around. This took two weeks to go around. This one took a little over one hour. You're vi witnessing visibly three third power acceleration. It's implicit on this chart. If you go to 1985, right in here, I'm going to have to send you around in a way inconceivable at the time of exotic. I'm going to have to send you around by radio. <laughs> this, this chart is the most powerful thing I've ever had to get me to really feel, want you to feel, the acceleration that we're in. Because all the things that you've been very familiar with, like the nations are going to go, and you see the United, case of the United States going into bankruptcy, going into uh, uh, all the great power really going from it very rapidly. You're going to have all kinds of things coming apart that you've been very familiar with, and in this place are going to be coming some of the things I've been talking to you about. I've, I've taken a lot of your time, and let me see what, what we are at in the way of the clock, clock time. That, that is the end of the slides. You can put on the lights again now. It is now 9.30. I've been exactly an hour, the hour and a half that we're supposed to. Now we're supposed to get into questions. You have a choice of asking me questions or letting me ask myself the questions I've been asking myself for a very long time and answering them in some kind of order for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have... A, telephone, and I keep getting telephone calls at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, and people say, I'm calling you long distance, and that seems to justify this strange hour. And so <laughs> I say, do I know you? And they say, no. And I said, I've got a very important question to ask you. I said, all right, I assume then you must think I have an answer, that's why you're calling. If, if I do have an answer, because 52 years ago, I made up my mind, I'm not going to ask anybody else any question, I'm going to find out for myself. So if you want, really want me to help you, I suggest you hang up. So I listen, I listen, glad to say a few of them do hang up. But if they start then talking, then I know they just lonely call up to show off. So, <laughs> so I, I hang up. <laughs> anyway, I would like to give you a little bit of what I think of some of the things that you're going to not only see all the great, great nations going and going, they'll have to go within 10 years. I feel that to, to have a very, I'm going to carry through a little more on the function of humans in the universe, which I spoke about as having a mind capability. I said, what can I find that's common to all lives and all history right up to this minute? Second, that is common to all lives, that problems, problems, problems. That all of us here are for problem solving and if you're any good at problem solving, you get much more difficult problem solving. It don't come to utopia at all. It goes exactly the opposite direction. <laughs> that we're quite here for problem solving, and we've been given access to some of the great design of the universe to help us solve the problems. I say, let's you and I look at a great design like a Boeing 747, go up far, there are all these instruments. And all those instruments are connected with different parts of your ship, the power plant and the, and the and airframe. Every bit of critical information regarding that ship is coming to you. And this is not only just to people who don't get into technology to think about what's really going on here in design. In designing a single family residence, 500 drawings is the most you have to have. You may use a thousand of this type of nail, but 500 will do. And the tolerance, 16th of an inch is fine. <laughs> get into the automobile, which is moving around with different parts at different rates. We have to really look out for that. We get to 5,000 types of parts in an automobile and tolerances of 10,000 of an inch. We get in that Boeing 747, we're up to about 50,000 types of parts with tolerances sometimes in millions of an inch. There's more engineering goes in one rivet than the, in Boeing 747 than the whole of a single family drone or even an automobile. When uh, in the, uh, that, that beautiful thing in the sky, we have then maybe it has, it has to be able to take 650 miles an hour, which is 10 times the velocity of a hurricane. And the, the, the resistance increases the second power of the, of, the, of the speed, so that the ferocity 
of, of the interaction of the Boeing 747 with the, uh, with the atmosphere is a hundred times the frosty of a hurricane. If you can, no way for our imagination really. And that's that thing going along, the silver thing going like that. With the, you take, take 350 tons and, and land it at 150 miles an hour, the music going is quite a piece of design. <laughs> <laughs> When they, when they say better fasten your seat belts, they'll bump you today. The stress involved with that ship is equivalent to taking Queen Mary over Niagara Falls, saying it's a little bumpy today. <laughs> <laughs> it's an incredible piece of design. And humanity knows so little of this. The ignorance of humanity, because of the, what I said, of, of the invisibility of the, of the reality. It's, it's such a, that. Today, there are 40 million engineers and scientists on our planet, but that's only 1% of humanity. And the 99% don't understand science because they don't understand the language of science. And the 99% who don't understand the language of science and words being quite new to them, think of the word technology as something new. They don't know that all the science that's ever found is the universe's most incredible technology. So the 99% think of technology as something new, it's weaponry and machinery to compete for their jobs. And they think they're against it. So here we have humanity is only out to really make it is by a design revolution of using technology to really make humanity a success, to be part of the great success of the universe itself. So we have, that's, that's a really very tough one. Now that, that relates primarily to the, the fact that the mathematics is, is the wrong is is a is 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 blockage, whereas indigestible to the, to the many. I'd like to get that point out of the way in a hurry. I became convinced when I was very young that nature was coordinating in a way that was not best expressed by the mathematics I was being taught. I was being taught, for instance, about pi, that you couldn't design a circular sphere without using pi. <clears throat> and I was taught, as I stated in mathematics, that pi was what he called transcendental and rational, could never be resolved. So I said, every time nature makes a bubble, how many she, times she carry out pi before she discovers it can't be resolved? What times na nature decides to make a fake bubble? I don't think nature is using pi. I, I don't think nature has departments of physics and mathematics and biology, and has to have a department head meetings to know what to do when a leaf falls in the water. I think she has only one department, and I'm eager to find it if I can. <coughs> and I found nature never saying, what shall I do? <laughs> I said, I, I, I don't have to, nature knew what, that's what I do. I wouldn't know what to do, but nature knew exactly what to do. <laughs> uh, so I said, I'd like to find nature's coordinate system. And I don't think it's going to be X, Y, Z, flat, perpendicular world, because that was when we thought it was a flat Earth. So that had been very convenient if it was true. And I, I, I said I, I made myself a tubular necklace of, of, of four tubes, and I found it didn't hold a shape, so I, I don't think it's using a square either, because there's no such thing that won't hold a shape. <laughs> I think next year, I, if I want to get anywhere near what she's doing, I'm going to have to deal in her in the terms of right from the beginning with all the energy qualities, it has to have, to have heat, it has to have, <coughs> has to have longevity, it has to have weight. And I saw the centimeter gram second system, tried very hard to get it, but they never could get the temperature in. So I said, if I, I'm going to deal in vectors. I like vectors, and I learned about those in the Naval Academy. I'd been taught about a straight line by my teacher at school. She said, straight, this is a straight line. I said it didn't look very straight to me, but anyway, she said it was. And, and she said it went to infinity. I said, where's the other end go? And she couldn't tell me. <laughs> so I didn't like the kind of things being taught at school at all. And, and I finally then got into pursuing nature's own coordinates. And I point out to you that nature does not op op operate perpendicularly parallel. Nature is convergent and divergent. She's radiationally divergent, gravitationally convergent. Everything we experience is to do with waves going omnidirectionally. So I discovered nature's own coordinate system turns out to be an omnitriangulating world where the minimum smallest system in the universe is the tetrahedron, the minimum, uh, all, a, a 
only polygon that's self-stabilizing is a triangle, and that is the, the tetrahedron is the smallest, uh, simplest structural system in the universe, so forth. We got into this, uh, you read my book, Synergetics, at any rate, and I have another book, volume two, will be coming out in September this year, and it's very, very much more voluminous, and, and we're absolutely confident now we really have found nature's coordinate system entirely rational, entirely conceptual, and any little child could really understand it. And enough about that, but I think it's going to be possible then through the video for the great 99% of humanity who don't understand science and technology can become extremely appreciative of it really almost overnight. And that would make it possible then to get them oriented towards exercising the option to make it with a design revolution. Now coming back to humans in the universe and their functioning, and then the fact that they have access to the great design of the universe, and they are some of it, and they have then also problems, problems, problems. Coming back to the great big Boeing 747, superbly designed, all those instruments up there, giving all the critical conditions on board of the ship, both the power plant and the airframe. I'd say then next to each one of those instruments is liable to be a, 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 another dial which should be bringing on automated response to the tip, tip, tip set of conditions of, of obtaining. And if, they, if those didn't work, then the, the, the pilot himself and the engineers can take over on the controls. Then, right, I'd say, in order to have a, an eternally regenerative universe, which is what we call scenario universe, and not, a, not an instant universe, and that in order to have a eternally regenerative universe, which is 100% efficient, you'd have to have then some local information gathering and some local problem solving in the terms of the fundamental design of that universe itself. I say, humans have been given that capability. Quite clearly, we've been able to go out and get that information 11 and a half billion light years around us. That we are here for local information gathering, local problem solving in, re in respect to the maintaining the integrity of an eternally regenerative universe. Now, nature then, when she has an important function to fulfill, does not have all the, say, all the eggs in one basket. She, for instance, just in order to have <coughs> humans humans on the universe to do this, going to have to use an enormous amount of energy. We can't get enough through our skins from the sun to carry on, so we have all the vegetation impounding the sun radiation for us. And then we have that vegetation then having to be rooted so that it can get water, it can, it can withstand the enormous winds, and, and also take care of its hydraulic compression requirements and get water back in the sky. Because the vegetation rooted, it can't go out and plant its seeds in preferred places. So it, nature then needs this very much to keep the human beings going on our planet, and she then has each tree launching and little flying machines of, of little seeds of, by the many, many thousands. Few of them may, may land where they'll be prospering, many of them will not. So when she has a very important function and very poor chance of survival of the, actually being realized, she makes many starts. I say she would not have then the function we have to perform <laughs> would not be just in this one little team on board a little planet Earth. The same function would be planted many places in the universe. And this particular one, I say, we've now come through the, the being designed deliberately, naked, helpless, ignorant, gotten to the point where we really discover these beautiful principles that we, our minds are everything, that our muscles are nothing. Well, I say, we're in final examination now as to whether we're really going to qualify <laughs> And not if we'd really qualify, mind must take over and we must get out of the way forever idea after earning a living. <laughs> that we really get, go on with our real, real function of, of solving local problems of the universe and getting more and more information. So I think our, our examination for my acceleration curve is saying we only have about 10 years to make it. In fact, I'm down to about eight years now. So maybe it's shorter still, but, no, but some, the acceleration is enormous. That's the main thing. And so, then you say, what can I do about it? The way things are set up now, all this political system, and I don't have anything to do with the political decisions. So, uh, everything really depends on you personally. <laughs> I wish I had a blackboard here, but I'm going to have to do something with you mentally, because we all have very good imaginations. I'm going to give you a triangle. <laughs> now I'm going to take, bisect the edge of that triangle interconnect. I got the edge, uh, edge reads two. Edge module is two. There's one, two, three, four triangles. Got to make a triangle now. Edge module is going to be three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Make it edge module is four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Make it edge module is four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Make it edge module is four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Make it edge module is
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So 16 is 2 to the, to the second power, and 9 is 3 to the second power, so forth. You can say triangle instead of squaring. And you find that only a triangle, the only polygon holds a shape. <laughs> and every, you can discover a square is two triangles. Nature is always most economical. <laughs> when nature multiplies herself times itself, which she does time and again, which is nature doing, triangling or squaring? I just gave you experimental evidence. <laughs> Squares don't even hold a shape. <laughs> which is nature using? You go, anybody goes out of this room saying, squaring, we're, humanity's all through. <laughs> His question from now on about your personal integrity in daring to really go along with experimental evidence. And really speak about it. Do something about it. If you do, then the whole thing's going to work. Because we do have the, all the evidence is there. We now have the capability to make it. So it's going to really depend on your personal integrity. I can give you the same thing showing that I make a little cube out of necklace of tubes. It just falls down. <laughs> travel there, travel with them. I put travel together and make the octahedron. Holds its shape, all triangulate. <laughs> and right, when we use a cube for unity, as we do with centimeter, gram, second, where a cube of water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we find that it is, the only reason it holds its shape if it does is because you have six square faces, don't you, on a cube. So I put a, a diagonal across each face. <laughs> it makes the, there's six edges of tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is holding it then. It has then, when you do that, that it has four, one, eighth octahedra superimposed on the 12 faces of the tetrahedron. When the tetrahedron is unity, the, the octahedron is volume of four, and the cube is exactly volume of three. And I could go on then to show you that we can then, with tetrahedron and octahedron filling space, that we can, we can come to all this, the third power, where I can show you quite clearly the module is, is one, we come out with one tetrahedron. The module, edge module is two, is, is eight tetrahedron. If, if the edge module is, remember, tetrahedron do not fill all the space by themselves. That would be complemented by the octahedron have volume of four. So I can simply show you that the, it's, it's, it's two, two, the edge, reads, edge module reads three, the, the volume is 27. If the edge module reads four, the volume is 64 of tetrahedron. <laughs> in terms of tetra. So I can say tetrahedroning instead of cubing. And if I'm using cubing, I'm using up three times as much universe as available. And that's exactly why the mathematics of science is so absolutely ridiculous. You have to get an imaginary number and everything to, to accommodate going out of this universe. If you say, using tetrahedron, you say right in the universe, it's all conceptual right from beginning to end. Don't have to have any nonsense about there are no models. Say, when, when does nature suddenly check in with models? <laughs> So we say it's the model is all the way, and all of it completely into transformable. Anyway, go into your synergetics to do it. So I say again, if anybody goes out of this room saying cubing when you see third power, again we're all through. Because <laughs> you need three times as much universes available. <laughs> Fairly simple. Now, so you, I, I want to really get out what, what I feel is what you personally can do <laughs> is going to be really depending on your, are you willing <laughs> to really have everybody accommodated? Are you willing to have everybody really get there? <laughs> or, or you got sort of an ego that doesn't want that to happen, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Are, are you really going to go along with the experimental evidence? But whether we make it or not, then it's not a matter of what, how our leaders behave, it's how humanity itself behaves. It's not a matter of a few being surviving, it's a matter of humanity. And humanity is going to go by virtue of fact, you've all now got a vocabulary, you've all got an enormous amount of information. And just how much guts have we really got to go along with information? The information is that all the, all the old systems are, are obsolete, They're not because they weren't good yesterday at all. They were absolutely essential to, like the, the umbilical cord was essential up to the time it came out of the womb. But we're coming out, it doesn't, say, I'm not saying the flag wasn't great yesterday, or what humanity has gone through. Incredible courage and love and dedication, humanity, get what it is. No, no, no faults at all with yesterday, but we, we're out of that womb. <laughs> we're supposed to be coming out now, and that's the, birth is the most dangerous time of all. We're, we're in birth. 
So I'm very deeply, as something I haven't said anything about tonight at all, 1927, I made up my mind to make myself an experimental, experimental, well, see a little individual could really do, and do everything with, with artifacts, not trying to reform human beings, but by participating in the environment itself, because I saw you and I, 60% water, and we are hydraulically designed, hydraulic compression, et cetera, that water freezes, boils in very small limits. We'd have to be in the biosphere. And, 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 and any other information-gaining phenomena operating on Mars would not look the way we do on in this particular planet here, in biosphere. So I came to thinking about many, many things, certainly about life and integrity and, and mind. And I ca came to the working conclusion, I was just all, all overwhelmed by the a priori intellectual integrity of our universe, that they, those, they were those generalized principles to be discovered, and that they really were a great design, and that it was only, be, only it could be intellectually expressed, which is mathematically. So I said, I'm overwhelmed with the great integrity, and, and I'm assuming then that I've been born at a moment when somebody is supposed to get in, poking their neck through, the information is here, and I became really very much of an outsider because I just wanted to understand I did not make good of the game of making money and so forth. I lost a lot of my friends' money. I was not only unknown generally, but pretty much in disgrace to the few who did know me. And I said, I'm really much, pretty much a throwaway, and I'd like to see what would happen if you really made an assumption about all the things as I've been giving to you, that there, it was implicit that we could do someday so much so little, take care of everybody. It was also, it seems to me, that I saw that human beings having this great hunger and so forth, gradually learning how to then to domesticate a milk cow, then learning how to take the hide of the cow and make shoes, and the shoe man making more shoes than he could wear, and the shoe man wants a milk cow, and the milk, can, milk cow man wants some, a pair of shoes. They realize they can't cut the, sh the cow up and still, still milk it. <laughs> So you know, and the man who grew the milk cow took him much more time to grow the milk cow than it took the man to make shoes. So this is when they invented money to make, make up for that. So I, have, I saw that nature, in order then to have human life going on our planet, but needing a great deal of energy, I spoke about having to have the vegetation to impound the sun radiation forest, and incidentally to be completely anti-entropic. That is to take the random receipts and convert them by the beautiful orderly molecular structures. And which other creatures could employ to grow more and more orderly types of species. And so that we were, the Earth was a very anti-entropic affair. At any rate, with the vegetation then doing this impounding <coughs> and being rooted, it couldn't reach the other vegetation to procreate. So nature then invented all the mobile creatures, whether it worms or butterflies, to go back and forth in traffic between all the vegetations to cross-pollinize them. But nature didn't say to the honeybee, I want you to go out and cross-pollinize all this vegetation. What nature did was give the bee a chromosomic instruction to go after honey, <laughs> just continually after honey, and inadvertently to knock off the pollen. So I saw nature was accomplishing all these things at 90 degrees. She gave p p drive like that. So I saw then she had all the human beings, that honey money drive, going after money, <laughs> and they got to sting it. Anybody try to take them away and sting them? So I said, but what she's really doing is at 90 degrees. So I said, supposing then I make the working assumption that what I've made, as I've given them to, that we have a function, if I committed myself to trying to abet that by developing environment controls that help to make them able to function more effectively, it could be that if I was doing what nature wanted, she'd, she'd have, I'd, I'd get on. It'd be very mysterious, but I had to, so I made a working assumption of enormous, I said I have to have, absolute faith in the integrity of the universe, and that if I'm doing what nature wants, I'll find myself getting on. So I, that is 52 years ago, and I have gone on all this time, and I've had to say, only the impossible has happened, <laughs> continually, day after day. <laughs> and I have been able to get on, I have been able to get the artifacts out, and they required really actually many millions of dollars, actually, but I never know, and I'm nothing to budget, it really only up the absolute last second, and if I don't get it on, then I realize I'm on the wrong track. Because then nobody banked my paper but my own. So I had to say, try this tack, go off the port tack. And what, what else? What next needs to be done? I made an incredible number of mistakes, but I've been able to get here. But I think it's worth your while knowing that I am, do represent also experiment in seeing if you can get on, if you really try to do what nature wants to get done, <laughs> rather than how do you look out for yourself. Now, that, that's the end. I, but I have, I'm overwhelmed by my faith in this way. I tell you that 
like all human beings, I couldn't be weaker and made many mistakes. There are times when I lose my faith and everything goes wrong. <laughs> and every time I just really dare to yield absolutely, then everything just works out superbly. Now, so I say, I know we have the option to make it. I think our time is very short. I think if we're going to make it, it's going to be by virtue of youth and truth. But really the most extraordinary thing about that young world is all, all worlds. I mean, that feeling you had of being loved. And the strongest feeling you have of suddenly loving. <laughs> so the young world knows that stones don't love stones, that there's something incredible in the world of love. So I find that young world, nobody's saying to them, get over your sensitivity anymore. They're really guarding their sensitivity. So they much more integrity of daring to really go along with what they see and, and what love tells them. So say, if we do make it on a planet, I know we have the option. It's going to be by virtue of the fact that the youth loves truth, and the youth abhors all hypocrisy. So the going to be love of truth, of youth, we may make it. Thank you. I've been very disappointed if you didn't do that, and I stood up hoping you would. <laughs> I, I'm, for the last five years, I'm averaging an audience of 1,500 every four days. And if you didn't stand up, you'd be the first audience that didn't. Now, what I feel is very important for you is the following. I spoke about 90 degrees and said like this. It's precession. And when, if you're in the room with me, like what I said, you say, I like what you said. Agrees pretty well in my experience, seems very reasonable. But when you're doing what you just did, is I'm just saying, I'm, telling, I'm going to tell the people beside me here that I, I like what you said. So you're talking to each other, not to me. And very important because we are, if we get into very critical conditions ahead here, we are very liable to have, I want you to remember about when Germany lost all its money in World War I, they got into dictatorship. At which point, the, nobody's allowed to know what the other one thinks, you're told what to think. And we're very liable, if we're getting, going to come in great many emergencies, there are liable to be a lot of guns out, there are going to be a lot of very sad things may happen. But I want you all to remember, I'm able to tell you, around the world, I've been speaking to people, people all respond, responding as you did just then. It's very important for me to be able to tell you that this is apparently speaking pretty much the way humanity around the world would feel is reasonable to carry on. Thank you.